Hi, this is Emily Freitag, and I'm so glad today to be talking to Heather Hill, Professor of Education at Harvard Graduate School of Education, and we will be focusing on professional learning. Um, Heather, thank you for joining Rethinking Intervention. Thanks for being here. Yeah, thanks for having me, Emily. It's nice to see you. Good to see you, too. Um, so as we do with all of these interviews, we'd love to just start by hearing a story from your own journey as a learner and what that has taught you about learning. Yeah, so I'll tell you the story of a non-academic learning experience that I have, have had, which is learning to play ultimate Frisbee. So two things you should know about me to start off is I'm not super coordinated. Um, so it's a little problem if you play ultimate to not be that coordinated. And um, I also ha have never played a team sport before playing, before playing ultimate. So I was not a high school athlete of any kind, but I picked up ultimate sometime during my adulthood and uh, was never any good until I started really playing consistent pickup with a bunch of folks that I uh, found through the internet. And what was interesting was first in the ultimate community is terrific because they were so patient with me as a learner. And like mm -hmm. the fact that I would drop the disc or I would make a terrible throw 80% of the time <laughs> when they would throw it to me didn't deter them from involving me in the game. And that's just mm. a really unique feature of Ultimate, but it's also a way to think about learning environments that can really help people grow mm -hmm. and thrive. So the second thing was they persisted at this for a very long period mm -hmm. of time. So, you know, I've been playing with them for almost 10 years, and I would really say it took until year seven or eight for me to actually become mediocre at playing <laughs> Ultimate. And they were terrifically patient the whole time, but also just persisted. And over a very long period of time, I was able to actually learn to play the game at a level that I'm comfortable and, you know, I'm not uh, the worst player out there anymore. <laughs> so the third thing that's also interesting about this is there's one particular person who um, taught me to play without ever speaking to me. So this is this guy, I think, mm. is a little shy or, you know, he's just not a talker in general, but he's also a pretty amazing ultimate player. And one of the things in ultimate is if you're that good at playing ultimate, you take it upon yourself to be responsible for training other people and teaching other people to play mm -hmm. in many cases. And so he taught me to play not by saying anything to me, not by giving coaching or tips or anything of that sort, by simply, but by simply uh, throwing me the disc where he wanted me to go or teaching me how to sort of do short kinds of passes or certain kinds of cuts um, mm -hmm. in ultimate, which is like when you're, when you're running to get the disc, um, by simply kind of just reinforcing the behaviors hmm. that I was doing and sort of selecting those behaviors and trying to um, improve them. So it was really interesting to watch that process and think about learning as a nonverbal activity hmm. that's going on between two people. That's so interesting. And it, it makes me think about like the interaction actually between you learning into that and him cueing you into that and sort of the interaction between you two that was actually happening there. Yeah, I, also, I often wonder whether he's even aware that he did it. You know, that's one thing that is, I'm, I'm very, I'm mm -hmm. still not quite a talker, so I have never <laughs> asked him about this, but I, you know, I often think, well, you know, is that sort of just behavior that he does all the time and he doesn't, wouldn't think that that's anything special, but I was attuned to it because I was able to say, oh, what, what he wants me to do is run over there uh -huh. the uh -huh. or throw it back to him, you know, as yeah. he runs over there kind of thing. So anyway. Yeah. So interesting. As a fellow ultimate player, I really enjoy that story. Yeah. Um, well, um, Heather, you've spent a lot of time thinking deeply about professional learning and mm -hmm. um, how we um, we collectively support teachers in their learning. Um, and as schools are thinking about such dramatic changes. It feels like such an important time to be anchored on what we really know to be true about what works in professional learning. So please share with us, what do you feel like um, are the kind of best practices and the known truths that we mm -hmm. should be anchoring to? Okay, so I'll start by telling you about a study that I did with Katie Lynch and a couple other um, colleagues at Harvard. And then I'll also tell you a little bit about what we couldn't learn in that study, but I think is true broadly across um, across situations in which teachers are learning and improving their practice. So we did a study that is a meta-analysis of teacher professional development um, and curriculum programs. And so we found 95 studies that looked at 
STEM, teacher professional development, you know, teachers learning new practices, or they were handed new curriculum materials and they were learning to use those, or the programs had a combination of professional development on top of curriculum materials. So it was a combination of those two elements together. And one of the things that we found in that study was that when you combined professional development with those curriculum materials and teachers were learning how to use those curriculum materials that they were, that they were handed, outcomes from those studies were more positive than outcomes for studies that had only professional development or only curriculum materials. So, hmm. and this totally makes a lot of sense to me. So, you know, oftentimes teachers will come away from professional development and say things like, well, that was a lot of ideas but mm -hmm. I need something I can take back into the classroom. And I think that, you know, teachers are indicating that they need something to help them carry out the ideas of professional development. Being, you know, teachers may be enthusiastic about new ideas for learning. They may be enthusiastic about new instructional practices, but unless they have something concrete to support them day to day in the classroom, it's much harder to implement those kinds of things. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that was a big finding from that study. Um, one of the other, there were several other findings, one of which was that when teachers, uh, when the professional development focused on pedagogical content knowledge and content knowledge, those programs boosted student outcomes beyond typical programs, typical professional development programs. The same was true for programs that had um, summer workshops, which was a surprise, I think, to everyone, because the interest has been in distributing learning across the year, but we found mm -hmm. positive impacts for these summer workshops above mm -hmm. and beyond typical impacts. Mm -hmm. And then we also found, um, and maybe you can shed light on this, Emily, because you probably, this is probably part of your program or part of programs you know mm -hmm. about it, but when teachers had a chance to come back together after beginning implementation of a new program and talk to the facilitator, talk to each other's, uh, say what's going well, what's not going well, can we troubleshoot uh, this issue? Those programs that just had often a three hour meeting, that's mm. all it really took, where teachers could get back together with a program leader or a coach or someone and discuss how the program was going, they also posted better benefits for mm. students at the end of the day. So mm. it's really interesting to think about these, these components and putting them together and sort of building a better professional development program mm -hmm. in a way. It, it, we don't have a lot of fine-grained information mm -hmm. about you know, what, you, what those ingredients would look like, but we know some of the structures now that can really help. That teachers. seem to correlate yeah. with bigger, yeah. So interesting, I'm, I'm brought back to a bunch of the professional learning work we did in Tennessee during the Race to the Top um, mm -hmm. rollout that, um, and we did see some years had more impact than others. And it is interesting. These design features kind of line up with that. Um, can, can we dig into each of these a little bit more? Um, yeah. The PCK or pedagogical content knowledge, let's describe what that is. Oh yeah, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Academics all talk in um, acronyms. So pedagogical content knowledge is knowledge that is unique to teaching. So for instance, one of the examples I'd like to use is if you're simplifying a fraction like two over four or two fourths, you know, there's a procedure for doing that. You divide two by two and you divide four by two, but oftentimes teachers get asked why that works. Mm -hmm. And the answer is you're dividing by two over two, which is one, you're not changing mm -hmm. the value of that mm -hmm. uh, fraction. You're just re-expressing it in a different format. Mm -hmm. And that turns out to be a really important idea, both in upper level mathematics, this idea that you can re-express quantities mm -hmm. and also in statistics. So that's the kind of thing that is teaching knowledge because it's going to come up in the classroom because it's going to sort of seed knowledge up the, you know, if kids have that kind of meta knowledge, mm -hmm. they will then, uh, you know, be able to thrive in other, with other content, mm -hmm. but it's not knowledge my mom has, right? Mm -hmm. Like my mom mm -hmm. doesn't have any sense for why that procedure works. She can do it. Like, you know, she mm -hmm. has to simplify. So the content it. knowledge would be like, I can do it. Yeah. But the pedagogical content knowledge is sort of, I know why it works and I know how to teach that particular thing. Exactly. And, you know, it also encompasses knowledge of kids' errors and mistakes as they're mm -hmm. learning content, mm -hmm. um, how to represent content to kids mm -hmm. in ways that are friendly. So there's a lot of things that are, are sort of blended. And we did talk to Deborah Ball, who, you know. Oh, yeah. Just refer in. to Deborah Balls. <laughs> <laughs> um, what I'd love to hear about, though, is because I feel like there have been conflicting messages around 
um, PD on content knowledge, like yeah. content knowledge alone versus content. Yes. Tell us a little bit more there about so what we, we found know. this. We actually have a little wrinkle in our finding, which is um, so we the original study was using student outcomes as the dependent mm -hmm. variable. Then we ran a study that looked at teacher uh, knowledge and teacher practice as mediating variables. So, you know, to what degree do studies, do programs, professional development programs and curriculum programs change teacher knowledge and practice and to what degree do they improve student outcomes? And we actually found that the, the effects on student outcomes correlated more with the changes in teacher practice than the changes in teacher knowledge. So there were programs in our data set where teachers did improve their knowledge. A lot of these were programs that were more mathematical mm -hmm. in nature. So it was like, let's fill teachers up with a lot of content that they didn't learn the first time or that is content mm -hmm. that's special to teaching. Those programs didn't see as high gains or any gains in some cases in student outcomes um, as the programs that also included a practice component. And I think one of the issues, this goes back again to what teachers tell us over and over, is that if they're learning content that doesn't directly apply and they can't see how to use it on a day-to-day -day basis in their classroom. So if you've mm -hmm. learned this new idea about when you're simplifying fractions, what's really going on, if your curriculum materials don't cue that or teach it a different way, you're not going to be able to actually implement that in your class. So I mm -hmm. think that's probably what's going but on. But the curriculum alone doesn't seem to then lead to the practice change. That's, it's that combo. That seems right, yes. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, that seems roughly right. So, so, and the teachers need a little bit of the, the content push to really make good use of their curriculum materials. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Thank you. I feel like I understand that better. And then, um, so just to mark it, the summer workshops you did see have impact mm -hmm. on student learning, um, but particularly when then combined with a chance to come back together after right. they've started applying it. That's right. Yeah. Okay. What else do we know or, or should we kind of uh, really anchor to um, about professional learning? And um, if you want to bridge into it, what do, what do you see people trying that we actually know doesn't work? Is, are are yeah. there some things we could rule out? So I'll answer the doesn't work question in a minute. Mm -hmm. so the, I think the sort of what else do we know goes back to this study that we did. So when we wrote the study proposal, um, we said, oh, and we're going to, we're going to code for the district surround, right? So this professional development program or this curriculum program is going into a particular context. Mm -hmm. And everything we know about policies, programs, reforms, they, when they go into context, those contexts reshape them. Mm -hmm. And so we thought we would be able to collect from these 95 studies something about the leadership support for the program and something about the um, alignment with other sets of curriculum materials or other instructional guidance offered to teachers. The studies had none of that information. So if you're a researcher watching this and you're about to write a report on a professional mm -hmm. development program, please include all that information. But more practically, it didn't allow us to really investigate the extent to which these district surrounds make a difference in terms of promoting better student outcomes. That said, I think there's really strong evidence from other single studies that the district surround makes a huge difference in the efficacy of new professional development curriculum materials or combined. So we've talked to teachers who've gone through intensive professional development and they say they love the professional development and we say, but we didn't see you doing anything differently in your classroom. So can you tell us what that's, what that's all about? And the teacher would, or the teachers would say back to us, well, my principal has a pacing guide and my principal walks by my classroom at mm -hmm. least once or twice a week. And I feel like I can't do the things that I learned about in the professional development because I need to be on the pacing guide, which means I need to be moving along at a pretty fast clip. And I need to be doing, another teacher would say, well, I love the professional development. I did it for a year, but then the district had a sort of RTI type thing come in where mm -hmm. we were required to do remedial instruction as 20, the first 20 minutes of our math class. And that meant that I couldn't mm -hmm. enact the professional development ideas in the way that I wanted. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there's a huge part of this, huge part of the success of these programs is the sort of alignment and the coherence into which they are 
mm-hmm. going. So if mm-hmm. you have a program that is at cross purposes with your teacher evaluation system, with your pacing guide, with your assessment, with other sources of Or with other PD, right? Other like, PD, totally. I got a thinking maps PD and now I have to do that. Mm-hmm. That's exactly right. And so I would say that this is the number one and districts, this is the number one problem facing improvement efforts because it takes a long time for teachers to develop expertise in something. Mm-hmm. You know, if you've learned something like my example of ultimate Frisbee, it really took me seven or eight years to get mm-hmm. good at the game. Mm-hmm. It's probably going to take a teacher to a couple, two or three years to be expert in teaching a particular set of curriculum materials. Mm-hmm. But often the cycles change much faster than that because a new superintendent comes in or somebody gets replaced in the district and suddenly there's a new idea about what to do. So mm-hmm. huge benefits yeah. from staying the course. Mm-hmm. So interesting. Yeah, that makes me think of our conversation with Candace Bacala about internal coherence framework. And then um, in our curriculum support guide research, um, we also found that like one of the biggest pitfalls of systems that hadn't didn't see the same success of curriculum implementation was this, I'm getting um, mixed messages, right? Yes. Like the my formative assessment system or my leader feedback or my pace and guide or the other PD I'm getting mm-hmm. just is all creating a lot of confusion. Yeah. So yeah, exactly. interesting. Okay. So what, what doesn't work? What, can, what do we, what, what should we know that we shouldn't do? <laughs> okay. So this is now moving from outside of this uh, STEM meta analysis that we did. Um, this comes from, I was, I've been reading these um, reports on teachers study of data for a long time. Um, you know, the, this is a really common activity in schools. You go into many schools and they have grade level teams and what the grade level teams spend a lot of their time on, not all, but a lot of their time on is, uh, you know, studying student assessment data, whether that be a state test, not very often state tests, but often interim assessments, often assessments that teachers design or they're collecting data from kids in other ways. And there's been, I think I located 11 or 12 studies of these kinds of programs and policies um, where, you know, formative assessment or a, not formative assessment, an interim assessment or Mm -hmm. a, you know, some kind of data was brought in and there's a process for teachers to study it and think about what it means for practice. The results there were just flat across the board. So I think of 19 impact estimates, there was one positive and one negative and the rest were zero. And it suggests that, you know, if it were just one program, I would say, well, there's something particular about that program or there's something particular about the district context in which they were working. Mm -hmm. I think across that many impact estimates and that many programs, um, what you're looking at is probably a a true zero um, Mm -hmm. for that particular intervention. I've seen some of these and I've had doctoral students write dissertations on these types of efforts. And I think what often happens when I've watched these is that the sort of focus on the students and the data doesn't turn into a focus on instruction and really thinking about, okay, so kids aren't understanding division or whatever. It doesn't go back to then like, let's look at our curriculum materials and think about how we're teaching division and do a rehearsal or think about how we could be doing that better, often the conversations end up moving toward, oh, you know, like this particular kid, Johnny, like he scored really poorly on this assessment, but he was having some problems that week and it was really just an aberration or a teacher saying, oh, you know, Johnny didn't do well on the division problems. Mm -hmm. You know, there's this like um, Tarzan division worksheet on Pinterest, you should really go find it. And so, you know, which further makes the, um, the content really incoherent or the sort of mm-hmm. the incoherence of the content for kids. Sorry, I also have a cat who is very curious. <laughs> Lovely to see your cat. <laughs> um, okay, so, the, so it leads to those conversations of like, here's some other materials, but what it doesn't lead to is fundamental thinking of it or just like thinking about developing teachers expertise i mean if you think about ways to develop expertise in teaching it is through the practice of teaching it's through reflecting on teaching it's through developing better decision making capabilities and if you think about the study of student assessment data like it doesn't support many of those things as it's currently constituted mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. that's a big finding yeah 
I was, I, we published this or I published this in March right before COVID hit. And it was, it's an Ed Week column that mm-hmm. we wrote. If you're curious about yeah, it, we can um, link to, we can it. Link to mm-hmm. it. And um, I received a lot of email about it, sometimes from people who are really distressed. I mean, to be, to sort of think, oh, something that we're doing isn't effective and something that we put all our eggs in that particular basket isn't effective mm-hmm. can be really mm-hmm. jarring and really shocking. But as important as it is to identify what works, it's also important to identify what doesn't work. Um, to be able to say we need to do less mm-hmm. of this or to do a better version of it or to move mm-hmm. to something that we know is much more effective. Do you have hypotheses on like the root of the distress or like or what the better way that maybe um, aligns to that root of s- distress? Yeah, well, I think teachers and principals who were those were the folks I was hearing from were just genuinely they were so concerned about their students and they're mm-hmm. so concerned about improving for students and they're driven to do it and that you know mm-hmm. being told that you're investing in something and have invested something in something heavily yeah doesn't work is just so awful. heartbreaking yeah. yeah it's just heartbreaking yeah. yeah I also just wonder I'm thinking to our conversation with Elaine Allensworth mm-hmm. and um, cause I, I do think the data systems and processes she was describing around their ninth grade on track work are actually quite different. different. Yeah. Can you totally. just mark that difference? So there's, I have no problem with administrators studying data. I think that's actually a terrific idea. Mm-hmm. Um, and they have a ter- wonderful system in which they're tracking kids so necessary right now and making sure that kids are staying on track. They're logging on, they're completing assignments so that we can catch folks who are not, for whatever reason, able to do those kinds of things and start to figure mm-hmm. out what's going on with them. Mm-hmm. Great idea. Same with principals or district folks that want to study broad assessment data and say, where are the problem spots? Is it fractions? It mm-hmm. will always be fractions, by the way, but <laughs> is it fractions? Is it long division? You know, and then start to think about uh, ways to target professional development around that content. Fantastic mm-hmm. idea. Uh, having teachers study student data is what the, the piece was about. And that's mm-hmm. where I think things break down. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So helpful. Anything else that you feel like you see people try that we actually know it's not? That doesn't work? Um, I think, well, so I, this is just a hypothesis on my part, mm-hmm. but I think of some of the professional development that is more abstract in nature that tries to change minds and beliefs Mm. uh, needs to be accompanied with with something that is much more concrete like new instructional Mm -hmm. practices so Mm -hmm. you know I think particularly in the equity space there are a lot of bets on if you can make teachers less more sensitive to racism if you can make teachers aware of their own privilege that's going to change behaviors but I think it's the same kind of issue that you're looking at in the math PD where teachers say, well, if you just give me some math ideas and sort of teach me about math learning, that doesn't help me very much. I need much more concrete strategies. Mm -hmm. And Mm -hmm. so I think we are making progress towards some of those Mm -hmm. more concrete strategies in the equity world, um, Mm -hmm. which has been terrific to watch and really, well, I know math, so I don't know other Mm -hmm. subjects, but it's been terrific to watch um, and say, we may be able to fairly soon be able to say, here's some really tightly controlled things that teachers can do to really engage kids in a different way in mm-hmm. classroom and particularly um, kids who have not profited in the current system of math instruction in the U.S. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, and then do you feel like the findings about the content and pedagogical content knowledge like Because I I think we do still see a lot of general pedagogy PD. Do you feel like we know enough to say like, that's not the best use of time? I would tend, well, so here's the thing. Um, I think that that is like a huge bucket, right? So it's too hard to say like some pieces of it. Like um, I think about um, my teaching partner at UVA, Mm -hmm. which is, has been shown over and over again to be highly effective in, um, you know, in engaging kids more and improving their learning. Um, and I would count that as general pedagogy, mm-hmm. professional development, it's not content specific. It's really, mm-hmm. they have a nice system of like ways to engage adolescents mm-hmm. um, who are often the kids who get turned off from schooling mm-hmm. and it's a way to build rapport and trust between 
you know, and relationship between teachers and students. So mm -hmm. there's, you know, some of that stuff, especially around the engagement piece, especially around the idea that um, you want classrooms to be more humane places for kids. Mm -hmm. I would say, go for it. Mm -hmm. There's some good evidence that that's, those kinds of things work. Um, you know, I think I'm a little bit more skeptical. I, I, I guess the other place that I'm a little bit more skeptical is in the um, SEL programs. Mm -hmm. Not that they're not effective. Many of them have been shown to be effective, but I think their effects are over overblown. Like when I took a look recently at the big um, meta-analyses, and I actually went through all the studies that were in these mm -hmm. meta-analyses of SEL programs. And I, at the end of the day, I was not convinced that once you throw out the studies with bad designs and you throw out the mm -hmm. studies that are like, I would not count as SEL studies that you end up with like the mm -hmm. huge bump that people claim. I think mm -hmm. the bump is much smaller, much more in line with professional development and mathematics and, and science and other subjects. Mm -hmm. Oh, I feel like these interviews just keep leading us back to this like <laughs> inescapable truth that, that it's a lot of different things adding up. Totally. Yeah. And coherence. Yeah. I mean, your kids aren't going to, no matter the, if the teacher is, knows a ton of math and has beautiful math pedagogy and is using great curriculum materials, if the kids aren't going to engage, they're not going to learn anything. Like that mm -hmm. is, that is the number one reality. Mm -hmm. um, and that's why it's, you know, the engagement of kids is pretty high on my list, even though I don't mm -hmm. study it. Um, PD mm -hmm. that does that, I think can be beneficially, like super mm -hmm. beneficial for kids and teachers. I mean, it's just better mm -hmm. if you're a teacher, if your kids are into it. Mm -hmm. So, But the general pedagogy, like I'm thinking of like, the hot skills PD, right? Like um, those feel like they are, they have less um, effectiveness if they don't get content specific and or practice specific. That would be my guess. Like if it, mm -hmm. anything that a teacher can't take back into the classroom in the form of specific, like a, here's a routine or a practice that I can use consistently with my kids. Mm -hmm. um, and regardless of what I teach or a set of curriculum materials that supports it, I think I would worry about those kinds of PD. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, Heather Hill, thank you for joining Rethinking yeah, Intervention. Great to see you, Emily. Great to see Thanks you too. All right. Have a good one.